Hello everyone. This is another video from Crowless and Ledger and WI. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for your cards and your emails and your phone calls while I was recovering from my operation. It um, really all meant, meant the world to me. So thank you all so much. Um, I'm much better now. I'm not going to be running a marathon this week or possibly ever, um, but I am feeling much better. Now, of course, we're still unable to meet in person. Um, I don't know when we'll be able to, um, but until that time, the committee is um, going to keep doing these, these videos and producing a newsletter for you and arranging our monthly or perhaps more frequent than monthly um, Zoom get togethers. So I hope that that's at least something, even though we can't all meet at the Merley Hall as we did. Um, I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe, staying out of trouble and enjoying the sunshine because it's been absolutely glorious, hasn't it? Right, our book group is meeting. They have a, um, they're have meeting this Friday at half past one to discuss 1984 by George Orwell. And next month they'll be meeting on Friday the 26th of June to discuss The Immortalists by Chloe Benjamin. So if that's something you think you might be interested in, um, send, either send us an email or get in touch with Pat Gloyne if you have her details. Um, Camera Club is still doing our weekly themes that Lisa sets for us. The most recent one was leaves, so we were all out in the garden snapping pictures of various leaves. Um, Di Kerno won this one with a lovely Mombrisha picture, so congratulations to Di. Um, Federation events, there are some plans, some coming up. Um, whether or not they'll go ahead, I don't know, but fingers crossed. On Monday the 7th of September is a Heritage Tour of Hale. Tuesday the 15th of September, a smartphone photography workshop in Mevagizzi. Thursday the 24th of September, Heavenly Greenery Flower Arranging at St. Anta Church in Carvis Bay. Friday, the 23rd of October, a Propagation Skills Workshop at the Duchy College in Camborne. Friday, the 6th of November, a Day of Art and Photography at Penley House Gallery. And as I said, I don't know if those will definitely go ahead or not, but if you are interested, um, do book a place. You'll have to send a personal check and send the application form um, directly to County. And don't worry that you will be reimbursed if the events are cancelled, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, we also have two competitions in the pipeline. The Blakely Salva Poetry Competition with a deadline of the 6th of July. And the theme this year is Trees for Life. So if you fancy writing a bit of poetry, um, either get in touch with the office or look in County News for some details about that. The other competition is a national WI one, Lady Denman Cup competition, and it's what I heard on the bus. So if you don't fancy writing poetry and you'd rather write a bit of prose, um, they're looking for a 500 word piece about something you've heard on the bus or imagined you'd heard on the bus. And the deadline to submit that to the Cornwall Federation is the 18th of September. There are some cancelled events. Um, Heavenly Greenery in Falmouth on the 22nd of July has been cancelled. Weaving for Beginners on the 28th of July. A Day at a Vineyard on the 10th of August and the camping weekend in early September have all been canceled. So I'm sorry if you booked any of those and we're hoping to attend them. Um, quite probably they will, be, they will be rescheduled for some future date, but in the meantime, you, you will get your money back for those if you've booked. Um, as you probably already know as well, the Royal Cornwall show is canceled this year, but um, BBC Radio Cornwall got in touch with the WI wanting us to help them put together a kind of a virtual Royal Cornwall show. It's going to be on the original dates of the show, which were the 4th, 5th and 6th of June. And the plan is to have interviews with some WI members on the radio uh, between 7 and 8 p.m. on the evenings of those dates. And also a, um, a digital gallery of WI members displaying craft items on a rainbow theme that they've made. And um, I know I've asked some of you, and as always, W um, Crowless and Ledger members have come up trumps. So if you look on the Radio Cornwall website on those days, I think you'll probably see a lot of Crowless and Ledger members, which is a great thing. Um, there's also Connect Cornwall, which is something that the Federation has put on. I don't know if any of you are participating, but it's been really good fun. Once a week, there is a workshop or, or a, a session on a, a different subject. We've had painting, we've had um, meditation, uh, we've had scrapbooking, and I think the most recent one is Pilates. Um, next week, I think, is singing. Some of these are on Zoom and some are on Facebook Live. So please follow the Federation Facebook page for updates and reminders about all of those events. Right, um, I'll stop waffling on now. Um, the next thing I'd like to um, introduce is a talk about being a beekeeper. 
by Gillian Rose, who lives in Birmingham, who's going to tell us about her experiences as a beekeeper. Enjoy it. Hello, my name is Jill Rose. I'm from Birmingham and I'm a beekeeper. And I'm here today to talk to you about my fascinating hobby. First, let's identify the honeybee. From left to right, the pictures are of a bumblebee, a solitary bee, a wasp, and finally, a worker honeybee which has pollen on its leg. That's the yellow bit. I started keeping bees about eight years ago, and the first thing I had to do was to get a hive. It would be no good to get bees without somewhere for them to live. The picture on the left is a skep, the first type of hive, which is mainly seen today as a honey pot in a gift shop. On the right, is the hive that most people probably recognise as a beehive. In fact, the middle picture is the hive that most beekeepers use today. It's called the National. These are the different parts of the beehive. On the bottom is the floor, which has an opening at the front which the bees use to get in and out. On top of that is the brood box, which is where the queen bee lays her eggs on frames, which we'll look at shortly. The dummy board is not a frame, but that is there to create space so that the frames can be taken out more easily to be inspected. The queen excluder comes next. The slots are big enough for worker bees to pass through, but too small for the queen. She therefore stays in the brood box to lay her eggs. The super, and there may be several on one hive, is where the bees store their honey on frames. The crown board helps to keep the bees contained in the hive. And finally, there's the roof. These are the two frames that I've just mentioned. On the brood frame, you can see the cells where the bees are developing. They are the orangey brown ones in the middle. In the top corners, the worker bees have made some honey, the light yellow cells, to feed the queen. The honey frames are kept in the supers and are filled with honey on both sides. This is a full frame ready for the honey to be harvested. The development of the bee starts when the queen lays an egg in one of the brood cells. This becomes a larva and then develops until it becomes a fully formed bee, which eats its way out of its cell and into the colony. Gestation from egg to emerging bee varies among queens, workers and drones. Queens emerge from their cells in 15 to 16 days, workers in 21 days and drones in 24 days. Here is a frame with worker bees on it. To the right, you'll see the brood cells with small larvae. Move to the left, the larvae get bigger, and the covered over brown cells are the, where the bees are developing. The main group of bees in the colony are workers. There will be up to 60,000 worker bees in the hive, and they're all female. There is one queen and there are between 100 and 200 drones in each hive. They are the only males. This is a worker bee. The bees that you can see on this frame are probably all workers. And you can also see the nice pattern of um, brood cells and honey 
that we saw on the brood frame earlier. Worker bees go through various roles in their lives. They start off as a cleaner bee, cleaning the brood cells so the queen can lay her eggs. Then they become an undertaker bee, clearing out all the dead bees from the hive. And then they become a nurse bee, which feeds the young bees and the queen. They become a builder next, building up the um, brood cells. Then they become a security bee who guards the hive from predators. And finally, in the last days of their life, they become a forager and go out to collect pollen. Here we have a queen bee, the one with the blue on her head, surrounded by workers who are probably feeding her. Each year we have a different coloured spot to put on the queen bee's head so that we can tell how old she is. This is a drone and as I said there are about 100-200 drones in a colony. They're the only male bees and their only job is to mate with the queen. They mate with her and then they die. If bees get too crowded in their hive, they may decide to swarm. This is a swarm of my bees. People say that if bees swarm, it's the sign of a bad beekeeper. But um, <clears throat> we won't go there. Swarming means that about half the bees will leave the hive with the queen to look for a new home. These bees are hanging around waiting for the scout bees to find them that new home. A swarm looks frightening, but in fact the bees are at their most gentle. It may take a while to find a new home, so before they leave the hive, they gorge on food which will keep them alive. It's a bit like us after a huge Sunday lunch, sleepy and lethargic. Because the queen has been taken away from the main hive, the bees left behind will raise a new queen from one of the brood cells in which the old queen has laid an egg. When the frames in the super have been filled with honey, it's time for the harvest. If you have only a few bees, this can be done by hand by slicing off the wax caps from the cells and draining the honey into a container. I quite like doing this. I, I find it very satisfying. With several hives, it's quicker and less sticky to use an extractor. This holds the frames upright, spins them round like a centrifuge, and the honey drains through the tap at the bottom into a bucket. You get honey from bees, obviously, which you can also turn into mead. But you also get other products. Honeycomb, beeswax, which you can use to make candles, lip balm, polish, and beeswax wraps, for example. Also propolis, an antiseptic. This is the stuff that bees use to plug any gaps in the hive and it is very sticky. Beekeepers have to abide by lots of rules and regulations, particularly surrounding the, the selling of honey, labelling and how it's produced, etc. But there are also other um, legal requirements, particularly to do with bee diseases. Here are some of my bee related photographs. Middle left, you can see me inspecting one of my brood frames. Bottom left, you can see one of my beehives wrapped in bubble wrap. I do this during the winter to help the bees conserve heat within the hive. And middle right, you can see a, um, a box in the boot of my car, which contains bees 
that I'm moving from one place to another. At the top is the Birmingham and District Beekeepers Association training apiary, when I go most Saturdays during the beekeeping season to help the new bees, the new beekeepers. Oops. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed that whistle-stop tour through the world of beekeeping. You may not know, but bees are an endangered species in the UK, which is quite worrying because they are needed, they're essential for pollinating plants, particularly the food that we, uh, that we eat, fruit, vegetables, that sort of thing. There are lots of things that people can do to help the bees to thrive. Um, start beekeeping yourself. But if you're not able to do that, then certainly plant lots of bee friendly flowers and shrubs in your garden. Things like um, bluebells, crocuses, lavender, mahonia, ivy in the winter, wisteria borage, comfrey. In fact, online there are lots of lists of, you know, the best 10 bee-friendly flowers to plant. Have a look at those and um, try and, and plant some to help the bees. I'll say goodbye now. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you for that, Jill. That was really interesting. Um, I've actually had some of the honey made by Jill's bees and it was absolutely delicious. Um, next up, we have a demonstration by Liz Woods um, on Ikebana, which is Japanese flower arranging. Liz is a friend of mine and a neighbor who lives just that way, not very far, a couple of minutes. Um, she's actually spoken to Crowless and Ludgman WI before on a different subject, uh, but now she's going to tell us about Japanese flower arranging. And what I'm going to do with you for the next few minutes is to talk about a particular type of Japanese flower arranging uh, and show you how to do a couple of uh, little projects that uh, might keep you occupied whilst we're all in our socially isolated homes. Um, the sort of ikebana that I do is called sugetsu, uh, which is a very informal type of ikebana. It's not like the very uh, stiff arrangements that you might be familiar with, however beautiful they are. Sugetsu is a much more relaxed uh, way of doing Japanese flower arranging, and although it pays attention to uh, the, the formal rules, and we'll talk about those a bit later on, it's really something that um, uh, you can do for yourself without having to go through all the many years of study that um, Ikebana masters uh, go through. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, an arrangement called a riku, which is a, a sacrificial flower. And the idea behind it is that you pick one perfect bloom at the height of its beauty. Uh, you uh, put it completely alone um, in a place where you will see it often. Uh, and uh, it will be a calming um, thing to look at. Uh, Riko originated in the 8th century with uh, Japanese Shinto monks who would pick one perfect flower and put it in front of a statue of the Buddha. And that was a way of honouring him and honouring nature. But for whatever reason uh, we do it, um, a, a Riku is a, is a very beautiful thing uh, to do. And you need um, a flat flower. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, walk across the garden to um, the uh, camellia bush and, uh, and pick, a, pick a perfect flower. So here we are at the camellia bush. Um, this is a very late camellia, but it's a water lily 
uh, style bloom. If you have a look at that, you can see it's really pretty. Um, I can't tell you what sort of camellia it is. Uh, it came with the house, um, but I'm going to see if I can find one that is um, absolutely perfect for our purposes. So let's have a quick look around here. Something. Oh, there's one down there that might do very nicely. Okay, so I'm just going to stop this and pick that. This is a viburnum and this also has flat flowers so you can see that that one might be quite suitable um, and in fact even something like that which is um, a, uh, uh, an azalea. Um, what you wouldn't go for is this sort of thing. You see the columbines there um, because they're, um, they're a bit spiky and they might not float uh, as, as you want. Anyway, I've got my camellia so let's go and do with it what we need. So now I'm uh, around the corner in my garden in a nice uh, little quiet area, in fact which I always think of as, as the Japanese garden which is highly appropriate and here I've got the camellia that I picked. It's a very nice one as you can see fully out and the first thing that we're going to do is to make this ready for, oh look we've got a snail on it, oh goodness me look here we go, golly so we'll take him off, put him somewhere safe. Right, we've now got our snailless camellia. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is, is we're going to trim off uh, these leaves. Um, but I might leave uh, that one, that top one there. Um, I've got a pair of uh, snips here, florists snips, but a you know, nice pair of sharp scissors would, would do just as well. So I'll take the leaves off. This is quite a common thing to do in a Nikibana because what you're trying to do of course is to show the flower off to its best advantage and um, it, it's, it really is a, a thing about less is more um, is it's Ikebana. Uh, if you're in doubt about an arrangement that you're making take something away from it and that often does the trick. So I've got two things uh, on the table in front of me which I'm going to show you. first one is just an ordinary washing up bowl, uh, pudding bowl actually, a uh, mixing bowl um, of water and the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, trim the base off the, the stalk off this really quite close but I'm going to do that under water. Um, so uh, and see if we can angle this so that you can see. Hang on a minute. No, that's a bit, that's a bit higher up. But anyway, so I'm going to put the end of the camellia into the water and snip, snip, snip until I've got it the length that I want it, which is not very long at all. And the reason for doing it under water um, is that um, you're creating a vacuum, and there won't be any air getting into the the, the tubes, um, whatever the blood vessels of a plant are called, um, and uh, that will make your uh, your arrangement last that little bit longer. And it's part of the ritual actually also of, of doing a cabana, which is a very um, calming meditative thing to do. I quite often do it um, in the early afternoons. You're supposed to pick flowers in the morning, but um, I don't usually do that. I'm usually too busy in the morning, but um, in the early afternoon when everything's a bit quiet and uh, you've got maybe half an hour to yourself it, it's a good time to do it. Um, so I've now got uh, the camellia snipped off, here we go, here it is, um, and it's been snipped off in water. Right, so next thing is the vessel in which we're going to put our arrangement and what I've got here is um, an asymmetrical soup bowl or cereal bowl uh, and the reason I've chosen this is because it's a good strong shape it's a completely plain um, thing uh, what you uh, definitely want in a cabana is something that will not distract from the uh, flower material that you're going to use so you wouldn't pick um, a vase or an, uh, a container with lots of decoration on it but inside and outside. Um, I like this one because it's uh, it's sloping at the top this side 
is higher than this side. Um, and because uh, it's a nice plain colour uh, and it shows off the blossom. And really all we're going to do is just to float our camellia in the top of this black bowl. Uh, and there we are. And I'll show you. And then I'll show you where I'm going to put it. And can we see that? There we can. Okay. Um, I'm going to put this in the bathroom. Uh, next to the sink where I clean my teeth. Uh, so that every time uh, I go and wash my hands, which we're all doing a lot of at the moment, uh, it's something beautiful to look at. And that's, I think, the nice thing about these very simple floating arrangements. They can go anywhere, but put them somewhere, put it by the sink, put it by the kitchen sink, put it by the side of your bed, put it on your dressing table, put it somewhere where you're going to see it a lot. Um, and, uh, and then you can really appreciate it. And it will give you a moment's calm and, and peacefulness. So there it is in the corner of my bathroom. So a very simple thing, uh, a floating flower, plain bowl, perfect blossom. Uh, and um, if you haven't got a black bowl, you can use a white one, but make sure that there's a good contrast. So let's show you something else. And here are three pansies. And here's a viburnum, uh, which is rather broken up, but it still looks pretty, I think, with those white flowers floating. So that's it, something very simple, just to give you a moment's pleasure in your day. I've just come down uh, what we always call the badger steps from the garden into Anne's wood. And the weather has turned a little bit. It's uh, not quite as nice as it, as it was, but still quite a pleasant place for a little bit of what the Japanese call forest bathing. And there's a few blue bars around and some cow parsley and you can probably see some pretty magnificent bracket fungus over there. Um, so what I'm looking for is um, some bits of old wood or a bit of old twisted root or something um, that we can make a, an arrangement with. Um, this is basically to uh, help you understand about two particular things um, in um, Ikebana. Uh, the concept of negative space, the space is between things. The space is, if you look, between the trees, not just looking at the trees themselves. And also the whole idea of beauty in decay, um, wabi-sabi, as the Japanese call it. So I'm just going to have a little wander around, see if I can find something that looks as though it might be suitable to do with what I have in mind. Oh, and look, nice little bit of twisted ivy root. So I'll take that back upstairs, up the uh, steps into the garden and uh, show you what we need to do next. So I've brought back the ivy root that I uh, was playing with a few minutes ago in the wood. And I've also got um, a vase here. Now this is absolutely nothing special, but the great thing about it is that it's, um, as you can see, it's got a good solid base here. And that's because I'm going to actually uh, make an arrangement which requires um, balance. It's going to be, it's going to look top heavy. And, um, it helps if you've got something that's not going to uh, fall over. And again, the same rules apply as before. This is, I like the, the lovely earthenware uh, pattern on here, but it's not a deliberate pattern. It's, a, it's just the way the, uh, the unglazed pot uh, has become. So um, just going to uh, put this down, pop some water in it, and then uh, show you what we do with our ivy root. I've propped the uh, vase up on a pile of books so that you can see me and you can see the, the vase in the same frame. Uh, and I'm going to take this root and um, see if I can balance it in the pot. So what you're looking for here is something like this, um, some shoots that go down like that, because that's going to be the basis of your arrangement. So, Pop that in there, 
How does that work? Oh, yeah, I think so. Oh, we might use that one better. No, first one's better. So pop that in there like that. Oh, that's better. That's better. That's a better one. It's nice and solid. And then we'll put the other one round it and balance it all together. How's that work? You need a lot of patience to do a cabana, but if you're doing it in a nice quiet time, I sometimes even put Japanese music on or jazz. Quiet jazz. So we're looking for a balance point and I particularly like this little bit of root here so I want to show that off. Nearly there. Oops. Try again. There we go. So um, I'll move away and actually you can see what I mean by a negative space. Um, you've got the roots of the ivy, but you've got all the idea of what's in and around amongst them. Now, I've also been into my garden and I've pulled out three things. This is a piece of Libertia. And I've taken also some uh, Narcissus uh, daffodil leaves. Daffodil's finished, obviously, but... Um, leaves are, are still around and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, play oh, here we go Look, there we are toppling it over already of course in a Japanese home this would be made in situ uh, in the alcove that all traditional Japanese houses have where there would be a scroll and an ikebana arrangement and perhaps a little shrine arrangement um, this is, I, I picked this particular bit of Libertia because it's not straight uh, and uh, nature rather abhors straight lines and so I'm going to even bend it a bit further. One of the things you can do with Kibana is you can, you very gently, you can just bend, bend and bend things, just achieve a more natural looking curve. So I'm going to, um, and I'm also going to drop a bit off the bottom of this, snip a bit off the bottom with my um, snips. And again, I would normally do that underwater. Okay, so we're going to thread that into here. Of course, you're looking at the front of, at uh, the back of the arrangement, I'm looking at the front of it. I quite like that to echo that curve. And I just try and bend it round a little bit. And sometimes you can prop things like that. Look, there we go. That's great. I really like that. And then take our little bits of green and thread those through the arrangement as well. Sometimes you might need to make a diagonal point at the bottom of your of your uh, leaves because actually makes if you've got a small aperture like I have here it makes it easier to get through and I'm just going to thread these through in as natural a way as I can sometimes I like to make things look as though the wind has been blowing them um, you're not trying to reproduce nature I suppose you're trying to make this the best of it. So let's get that in there like that. See if I can just thread that one down. Almost. There we go. Come on. That's it. That's going down. Threes is the other thing. Three flowers or three leaves 
uh, threes, triangles. That's important. It's like when you're planting, don't you? You put plants in a, in a border in the garden. You always plant in threes or fives or sevens. That's so that your eye is slightly confused. It doesn't sort of go to a straight line. Pop that one in there somewhere. If I can get that one in. Oh, I'm not sure I can actually. No, it might have to come in the back like these. And whoop! The cabana doesn't travel terribly well. What I quite often do is make the arrangement on a small table, which is where I'm going to put this in a minute, and, um, and then take a photograph of it uh, in its final place. So, so there we have it, uh, a nice arrangement in its final position, uh, something which is definitely wabi-sabi, the root, something decayed, something which shows us that um, spring might be here, lovely bits of green, and that very, very beautiful bit of Libertia. It's very understated. Less is definitely more in Ikebana. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I certainly did. There's lots of Ikebana inspiration online. You can look at um, Instagram particularly. You're looking for Sagetsu Ikebana. Or oh, you can look at the other ones that I've done on there. Liz Woods, number one, number seven. It's been my pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for sharing those beautiful arrangements with us. Um, if any of you would like to have a go at Ikebana, at making some very minimalistic flower arrangements, um, please do. And if you take some pictures, send them, send them by email and we'll put them on the website and perhaps in the next newsletter. Right, now I'd like to introduce Di Kerno, who's got a little project she'd like to explain about recipes. Here you go, Di. Hello everyone, my name is Diane Kerno, and I am a member of your WI committee. You may remember when we last met at Murley Hall, Val Puddyford explained that we were hoping to make various craft items to sell on a stall to make money for our funds. A group of us got together and we did make some aprons. But because of the present situation with lockdown, it is impossible for us to meet at the moment. However, one of the items that we hoped to sell on our store was recipe cards. And this is where you can help. Please, can you send your favorite tried and tested recipe into our website? It could be sweet, savoury, cake, biscuit, it doesn't matter, so long as it works. You may like to add a photograph of the end product or draw a small picture, but if you can't do that, that doesn't matter. Your recipe will be written on cards, laminated and sold at our store, whenever that might be, or maybe at our sales table on our monthly meeting. Please send your recipes to our website doesn't matter how many you send in, so long as you know they work. At the moment, we don't know when we will meet again, but until then, stay safe, take care, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Goodbye. Thank you, Di. Um, so please do email us all of your recipes, but please do make sure that you're not just copying recipes from a cookbook or from the internet. Um, because there are copyright issues and we don't want to get in trouble. So any sort of family, friend recipes that have been passed down to you, um, those would be great, or any um, recipes from cookbooks that maybe you've adapted or changed, um, but please make sure you, you're aware of copyright issues. Um, I think that's everything for now. Um, I just wanted to say that the committee is hoping to hold some kind of a big lunch um, on Saturday the 6th of June. Um, it will be a virtual lunch, possibly on Zoom, um, Details are still in the works, but um, we will keep you posted by email and let you know what's planned. Um, but hold the date, Saturday the 6th of June at lunchtime. Um, we do have another newsletter coming out fairly soon that we're putting together at the moment, so stay tuned for that. And otherwise, um, please join us for our next um, regular meeting day when we'll have a Zoom get-together again, and that's Monday the 15th of June. Looking forward to seeing you then. Bye! <laughs>